Heat and AC test 17, let's get moving on this thing. Uh, modern cooling systems are designed to maintain an engine temperature of what? Uh, 180 to 230 sounds right to me. Everybody else like that answer? Like that answer, 180 to 230, is that a B? Basically a B. You got a B there? All right, that's B. Okay, two technicians are discussing thermostats and coolant circulation. Technician A says the coolant does not circulate while the thermostat is closed. Technician B says the heater doesn't blow warm air when, while the engine is cold because of this. Which technician is correct? Neither one of those guys is right. The coolant does circulate. It just doesn't go through the radiator. It has to have somewhere to go. How many of you have ever heard on a, a, on a, a bypass hose? You ever seen one? A bypass hose? It's a little hose that bypasses the thermostat. You know, a lot of times you'll see a little hose, a big hose coming off the thermostat housing. And uh, it actually, usually, most of them now will bypass through the heater core. So as soon as the coolant starts to get warm, it goes through the heater core and that's, you'll start getting your heat right away. The thermostat has nothing to do with it going through the heater core, but it has everything to do with it going through the radiator. Uh, while discussing coolant system operation, technician A says the engine will overheat if the thermostat sticks in the open position. That's not right, although there, you'll run into people now and again that think they've unlocked the mysteries of the universe that will swear up and down and argue with you until they die that if you take the thermostat out of a car, it will overheat. I mean, I've had people just want to be really smart aleck. These are people that don't work on cars for a living, but they think that they're smarter than everybody else because somebody eons ago had a Mustang that had a really thin radiator in it and they pulled a thermostat out when the water was going through the radiator so fast it didn't have time to lose its heat and it overheated. But that's like one car in 10,000. Just about every single time if the thermostat sticks open it's going to run too cold. And if one's running too cold the thermostat is always what's wrong with it. I had one guy telling me that he had a belt that was routed wrong that was making it run too cold but I don't know about all that. Yeah, some like he's spinning a water pump the wrong way or something. I don't know. It's, yeah, I mean that's, that was an email thing. I can't. I never saw that vehicle. Um, yeah, really. Um, but uh, technician B says heater operation will be affected if thermostat sticks open. Is he right? You know, if your running engine's running too cold, you're not going to have a good heater. So that's a B. On most engine blocks, the coolant flow is into the what? A in the top and out the top. B in the bottom and out the bottom, C in the bottom and out the top, D in the top and out the bottom. <laughs> it's in the bottom and out the top, really? What do you think? In engine blocks, right? You understand what I'm saying? Now when you talk about the radiator now, we're talking about the engine block. So the water pump, where does the, you know, the, on the ones that have the hose hooked to the water pump, you know, the coolant's coming into the water pump that way and it's coming goes through the engine block and then comes out past the thermostat into the radiator, right? So it's flowing into the radiator past the thermostat. See it, the way it's making that circle? So just keep that in mind, too. Now, like on that Crown Victoria out there, uh, it, the water pump doesn't have any hoses you unhooked, so everything is actually hooked to the block that way. Okay, now then, uh, two technicians are discussing coolant circulation. Technician A says that the coolant flow flows from the uh, bottom to the top in older radiator designs. Technician B says the coolant flows from one side of the radiator to the other in a cross flow design. Which technician is correct about that? That is B. That is technician B. What was four? Uh, four is actually going to go uh, in the bottom and out the top. Now we're talking flow through the block, not the radiator. Remember that when you're talking about that. I will tell you this that you've got um, some cars that have the thermostat in screwball places, and so be a be aware of the fact that some of them are different than that. And just, that's why it says most engine blocks. Um, like uh, on the old Volkswagen diesel, uh, I mean, excuse me, Volkswagen slant four engines like the diesel and the gas burners, the uh, thermostat was on the bottom and, they, and the top hose was open. And these Toyotas are like that too, these Camrys, the, like, you know, mid to late 90s Camrys and all. Okay, um, let me see. Uh, do, 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 number five, we're talking about going flowing through the radiator. Uh, how many of you guys have ever seen a, uh, you know, what's a cross flow radiator versus a uh, the other kind? You know, whenever you took the radiator cap loose and it was right square in the middle of the radiator and you open it up and you look down in there and you can see your flues, that's the one that, that's the vertical flues. Just about every single radiator they have out there now, the flues are running sideways. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me see. Number six, the boiling point of water. 
uh, with a 15, in other words, number five is actually uh, B, by the way. And the boiling point of water with a 15 psi pressure cap is about what? If you got a, if you got 15 pounds of pressure on it, what's the boiling point going to be? 250. You put it under pressure, it raises the boiling point. You know that. But it's, but it's only like 15 psi. Yeah, I know, but that's no 15 psi is in addition to what's already in the air. You know, that's what that spring is about. That spring on the radiator cap has got, it's got to build 15 pounds of pressure inside that radiator before it can push that open. And in order to do that, it's got to come up 250 degrees. Furthermore, your uh, coolant raises it. You know, Zach, get off that phone. Uh, the amount of power required to drive a fan is affected by what? All of them. Diameter, number of blades, blade pitch. Um, two technicians are discussing fan clutches. Technician A says... Some fan clutches have a thermostatic valve that flows, allows a clutch to drive the fan when it gets hot. Technician B says a fan clutch allows a large fan to be used with a lower noise level and power loss. And lower power loss, basically, they didn't lose. In other words, that sounds as a screwed up question. Which technician is correct about that? That's number eight. Yeah, if uh, some fan clutches have a thermostatic valve, is that right, Zach? Zach, are you paying attention? Zach. Yeah. Hello, Zach. Sir. Yeah. Uh, you remember what I showed you about that? I've held this fan up here before. This is a fan clutch. All right, you see this little thing right here? This thing right here is a bimetal strip. And if you take a torch and you heat that bimetal strip, it's going to change shape. It's going to bow out and it's going to move something inside here and it's going to actually change the effort that it takes to do this. Now, a lot of them, most of them aren't made like this. Most of them have got a bimetal spiral spring and it's anchored here and in the middle, it's got this little thing that it's notched into, a little valve, and as it, that spiral spring, the heat coming through the radiator causes it to change position, and it's going to make this more stiff so that the fan will pull more air. Well, as the fan pulls more air, the radiator cools down, and that spiral spring changes shape again, and it gets easy again, you see. And that's what a fan clutch is about. A fan clutch, say, I'm actually holding that while I'm turning this. It keeps you from robbing so much power. And if you ever, somebody ever comes in and it sounds like my car ain't got no power, and it sounds like an airplane taking off, it's really noisy, first thing you do is have them switch it off and feel of the fan. And if that fan has got a fan clutch on it like that and you can't move it, it needs a fan clutch. Sometimes they're pretty expensive. Uh, the newer ones have got a fan clutch that's got uh, a wire connected to it, and the engine controller actually controls how much it's, you know, actually controls the speed of the fan, but it's got a clutch similar to that, only it's electrically actuated. Um, two technicians are discussing fan clutches. What's that, Gene? No, I didn't know that. No, it doesn't particularly surprise me, but what we probably need to do is put it out of the rain. You know what I mean? No, I didn't. I have not noticed that, uh, but I need to, you know, I need to see about it. All right. He said somebody broke the back glass out of the Hyundai. Uh, the back windshield out of that purple car. Sonata? Really? Yeah. Why, like completely? Yeah, he said, it, well, a back glass, it turns into little cubes. Whenever you break it, it ain't like a windshield. It's got a nice little... Oh, no, no. And all you do... Who's in there? Huh? Who's the, there back the back windshield? Is it like, did he say it looks like this stuff? No, he just told me, he told me it was broke just now. But I mean, it... It must have just happened, but we'll go look at it. That's what I think, because we were just looking at it, like, why before we came in here? It looked fine. So it was okay before y'all came in here, and now it's broken. Jesus! That was about right before. Well, actually, I was a little bit, little bit before we came in here, but it was fine. Yeah. I mean, it looked fine, unless it just... Well, what I'll, I'll need to... Look at it we'll need to... If it's broke, we'll need to put it out of the weather until we can get something done about that. Um, two technicians are discussing fan clutches. Uh, let's see. What was the answer to that? See? Oh, number eight. That's going to be C. Uh, an electric cooling system fan is controlled by what? Cooling system temperature, AC operation, or A and B. A. How many of you notice that when you turn on your air conditioner, it kicks a fan on, you know, typically? That's a generic statement, but that's pretty much what it goes. That's both A and B. I think that is. All right, let's flip your test over. Our first page of it. The best amount of ethylene glycol to mix into the coolant is what? 50%. Let me go so far as to say some coolants are not mixed 50-50 and you need to make sure that you've consulted your literature. Some of them are mixed with a more, with a different element, I mean different uh, ratio. 
Um, I read that a while back like somewhere, but just make sure that you're aware that most of them are 50-50, but occasionally you may run into one that's not 50-50. So I don't know. We, you should, like 25, or something like that. But, yeah, uh, something yeah. like that. Is on your Toyota, you mean? Or, yeah. No, I don't remember where I've seen that. Yeah, yeah I saw, I've seen that somewhere, too. I've seen it somewhere. I don't remember where. Yeah. An engine block heater is used on some vehicles in very cold climates in order to do what? Is it supposed to decrease fuel mileage, provide faster engine warm-up, increase exhaust, decrease exhaust emissions, or none of these? Basically, it provides faster engine warm-up. Of course, it also helps with cold exhaust emissions. Uh, a hybrid vehicle may have a tendency to have low coolant temperatures. This is due to what? If you switch, I mean, whenever you stop, the engine stops, right? On some of them, idle stop. You pull up to a stoplight, the engine goes dead. <laughs> Uh, Jimmy said that somebody brought a, uh, a somebody driving a government car that was a hybrid brought it to the Ford place and said that the engine stalls whenever I stop at a light. And Jimmy said it's supposed to do that. <laughs> That's the way it's designed, you know. But the guy was confused. He had never driven a hybrid before, and that car was confusing him because of the way it was doing it. On I most vehicles, huh? Like what? If you didn't know, I could see that being an issue. Like, yeah, oh, if, yeah well, if you're used to driving a regular car. On most vehicles with a serpentine belt, the belt is tensioned by doing what? Do you change the belt size? Do you have guide ramps? Do you use a slotted adjuster bolt or a spring-loaded tensioner? Now, believe it or not, that's deep, but on some of these Ford cars, there's actually belts that are rubber. There's actually belts that are rubberized that, are, uh, that you have to put on there with a special tool. And the way you get them off is you get a canvas strap and you roll it up between the pulley and the belt and you roll it off the pulley. <laughs> they don't even have a tensioner on them, some of, the, some of the Ford cars. I don't know if they're doing, I mean, when they started to stop that, but I remember reading about it, you know, it's pretty cool. Stuff. 12, was it huh? Yeah, that's on a D, spring loaded tensioner. Number 14, a unique feature of a thermal siphon cooling system is that A, it has no radiator, B, it has no water pump, C, it uses no radiator hoses, or D, <laughs> none of these. B, it has no water pump. Do you know the old Model A's that you used to, the old Model A pickups and cars and all that? They didn't have a water pump on them. They basically would be like a coffee pot. It percolated the water and it went up through the top hose and it went down through the radiator and it came back in. It was drawing, you know, constantly circulating by there. It was always percolating through. And you'll see the cylinder. Where is your test at? You got it right there? Okay. But uh, you'll see the cylinder head on those that water passage is coming in a slant, coming off the thing. That's interesting how that's set up. Um, Referring to the illustration, what is the state of coolant in this system? This illustration here, this is a radiator cap. What's the state of the coolant in this system? Huh? Number 15, that's B. Cooling down. Look at the direction that the coolant is flowing. Exactly. It's, it, it's, coming, it's, being, it's coming in from the surge tank. And it's going back in. So if it's cooling down, the coolant's contracting, and has that little valve, see that little valve right in the middle on the bottom, that little vacuum valve, it's, it's got it opened up and it's pulling it back in there. Now, when I take the radiator cap and modify it and pull all that stuff off, I'm just letting the stuff come and go as it pleases. You can't run one like that because it'll, you know, if you get air in your cooling system a lot, it causes it to rust up and causes all kinds of issues. Uh, so you need it to be sealed and completely full. I moved it inside on this. They said that window must have just got broke because it wasn't broke 10 minutes ago. You're talking about the rear, the rear, whatever you call it, the rear, whatever. Yeah. yeah the trunk window, whatever, you know, yeah. you know. Hey, how bad, bro? Like, really? There's a hole missing that big. A hole? And if it's laying inside, well, excuse me, the hole's not missing, the hole's there. There's a piece of glass missing about this big laying inside. Yeah. I'm pretty sure we would have noticed a hole in the window. Yeah, there. well, see, they were over there cleaning that place out. Yeah, they we were over there in that shop, really. Heat stroke, boys. I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I don't know either. But anyway, it's inside next to your front end machine. Okay, That's I'll get something done with that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we would have noticed the hole. Yeah. I don't know, man. I don't know either. That's weird. It's on my nose when I went to take a leak, boys. That's all. <laughs> Yeah, that'll go on YouTube. All right, let me see here. Uh, which of which of the numbered components here? <laughs> this is a silly question because he's got it color coded. Which of the number co numbered components is the thermostat? <laughs> That's just plum comical. Let's color it so that they'll know exactly which one that we're looking at. Number sixteen. That is actually C, which is number two. Okay, refer to this illustration. Which location is the most common placement for the thermostat? Yeah, that's actually, uh, is that right? That's where it's 
basically right in there. That's the most common. Now the reason they say that is it's not always in that top. I tell you what's really disgusting is if you're winging it, if you just wing it and something, you're going to put a thermostat in there and you go to a lot of trouble to take this top neck off and then you find out the thermostat is some in a bottom hose and you'll do that sometimes. You'll say, well, there's no thermostat in here. It doesn't even look like one goes in here. That's because it's in the other hose. You better look look it up if you're not sure, if it's a car you're not sure about. So just be sure. And uh, Daniel, you may run into that at the Toyota place and get smacked around and it'll make you look plum silly and they'll laugh at you. Okay, number uh, 18. Yeah. Uh, number 17, remember, is an A, okay? Number 18, most modern vehicles use what kind of a drive belt? Uh, uh, C, serpentine, that's the one with all the grooves. A 50-50 coolant mixture will provide extra protection against what? Yeah, hot spots in the engine, rust formation, boil over, or all of the above. I will tell you this, guys, I have seen vehicles that were overheating, that were, you know, just getting too hot. Uh, and the only thing wrong with them was the coolant was wore out and it wasn't working. I mean like it was a dark color, I mean a sort of a brownish color, but it didn't have a lot of rust in it. But whenever I flushed the coolant system and put fresh antifreeze in there, it cooled down. So be aware of the fact that there may be nothing wrong with it except you need a coolant flush. You know, and I'm talking about that one, I just drained the coolant out and poured fresh coolant in it. You know. uh, which component releases excess pressure from the coolant system? Uh, that's actually going to be A, that the radiator cap does that, you know, it, it unseats that spring. And we got uh, three more questions on this after test. You, uh, we're talking about like after you remove it? No, whenever it's got a spring loaded, uh, that little thing is spring loaded, sits against that neck and radiator. When the pressure comes up, it opens it up. It's like okay, the radiator cap. The uh, yeah, it does. The radiator cap's a pressure relief valve. I thought that was to push it and hold the pressure. No, it, well, that holds it down there, but it also moves and lets pressure out so it can go to the surge tank. Number 21, uh, I have to go over that again with you because you missed it. No, uh, an engine that runs too cold can cause what? A, the mill to come on, B, poor transmission performance, C, poor fuel mileage, D, all of these. Uh, all of these because uh, the torque converter will not even lock in if the engine is, in other words, you, the lockup torque converter won't work if the engine is too cold. Um, Number 22, a hybrid vehicle may have more than one cooling system. True or false? True. And number 23, two technicians are discussing coolant circulation. Technician A says, some modern vehicles use thermal siphon coolant circulation. Technician B says, coolant flows from one side of the radiator to the other in a cross-flow design. Yeah, 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 that's B. We've already seen a question so similar to that. It wasn't even funny. Now let's jump on over here to heat and AC test 18. Uh, we're still talking coolant system stuff here. Uh, we're going to saturate you guys with coolant systems. Um, in a modern cooling system, the coolant level is checked where? A, at the radiator, B, at the coolant recovery reservoir, C, at the thermostat cover, or D, none of these? D, B. All right, what do you think? You said, what do you say, D or B? B, yeah. Yeah, B, coolant recovery reservoir. Now, let me go so far as to say this. If that vehicle has got a radiator cap on the radiator and a coolant recovery reservoir, both, right? and you look at that coolant recovery reservoir and it's in between the low and the add marks, that doesn't mean there's coolant in the radiator. You know what I mean? So you better let that pressure off or fill the hose and make sure it's not tight and check in that radiator too. Because that one can have coolant in it and the radiator can be empty and you can burn one up when you say, well, I checked the coolant. Well, how'd you check it? Well, uh, I saw some in that bottle over there. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Now, I will tell you this. If the thing's working like it's supposed to, and you've been monitoring it really carefully, as the coolant goes low in the radiator, like it's got a leak somewhere, it will pull the coolant out of that bottle. But just because there's coolant in that bottle don't mean there's coolant in the radiator. You better double check that. But also be aware of the fact that you squeeze the hose before you pull the cap off the radiator because you don't want to get hosed down with third degree burns. You know, that's not a, that, that'll ruin your whole day. Um, while discussing coolant changes, Technician A says an old, the old coolant can simply be poured down the drain. Is he right? Wrong. Technician B says that used coolant must be recycled. Wrong. Whatever happens, it must be carried away from here by somebody in a truck. You don't pour it on the ground. You don't pour it on the drain. You don't pour it in a parking lot. Now, occasionally, you're going to see coolant leaks. How many of you ever parked in a parking lot and walked in there by where a car was parked and there was a puddle antifreeze there? Yeah. You seen that? You know, whoop, somebody got a leak, right? Yeah. <laughs> I've seen that before. Uh, I was I was over there at the. Uh, I've said something that you did. I was at the big little store one time in Enterprise, and there was water dribbling out from under this car, and this guy was looking under his car and he was concerned about it, and this 
know-it-all was standing there talking to him and says, uh, and that guy says, I wonder where that water's coming from. I say, oh, that's a freeze plug. Those freeze plugs are on both sides of the block, and they rust out sometimes, and they pop out and all that kind of stuff. And I looked down there, and the water was clear. And I said, that ain't a freeze plug. That's the evaporator drain. And I guy said, what's the evaporator drain? They I said, oh, that's that thing in the radiator. <laughs> he just switched. He changed gears from the freeze plug to the evaporator drain. That was plum plenty. But to me, you know, he was, he was, he was, he was yeah, he wanted to teach, you know. I mean, that's all I said on the way by. I said, that's just the operator, right? Because it was too clear and pretty, you know, the water's so clean. That guy was like, this guy yeah. walking up. He was just a bystander talking to the guy that owned the car. Which one um, uh, That one there is going to be, are you talking about two or three? Two. Two is B. Um, two technicians are discussing coolant flow. Technician A says you should not be able to feel a coolant flow through the upper radiator hose while the engine is cold. Technician B says when the thermostat opens, the upper hose should start getting hot. You should feel flow through it. Mr. Technician, that's correct. Ooh. Both of them. Well, and uh, I have hammered and hammered and hammered and hammered on this. you got to make doggone sure that that thermostat is open and that coolant flowing through there. I learned that in the early 70s working at a gas station. And it seems to me like it's one of the hardest things to get across to people nowadays. Of course, another thing you don't want people to do is put their fan on there so that it knocks a hole in their radiator or whatever they kick on either. Sometimes. Yeah. All right. But make sure that when you put the radiator back on there, you bleed the cooling system correctly, too. You get me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. He actually was uh, just sort of inattention, is what he calls that. Uh, whenever you put the thing on there and, and it goes crunch up against the flues, you know. Technician A says a Technician A says a cooling system should hold pressure for at least two minutes when its pressure is checked. Technician B says a pressure tester can also be used to check for combustion leaks. Which technician is correct? What do you think? Well, what do you, how would you use a, com, a cooling system pressure tester to check for combustion leaks? Come on, guys. What does a combustion leak do? It puts pressure in the cooling system. Uh, okay. If you crank it up and you got your compression, your tester on there, and it's got a pressure gauge on it, and the pressure keeps climbing because it's going in there. Now we've also got this kit out here that you can mix this uh, chemical, and you can it'll change colors if there's compression going in there. You know, I got one of the combustion la gas leak detector. Uh, number five, uh, thermostat that's stuck open causes the engine to overheat. We went we went there last time. Will it or won't it? Stuck open. stuck open, or I don't see them stuck open as often as I see them. That you may pull a thermostat out and it looked just fine. Uh, and I, I did this. Listen to this. My Jeep was running really cold. All of a sudden, it used to run about 220, 210. And one day, I noticed it was running like around 125 degrees. And I said, "That ain't no good. That's lousy." And it was cold. The heater didn't work. Where the flip and all that. We pulled a thermostat out of the thing. We dropped it in a bucket of water. And we heated it up just to see when it would open. And it didn't open until it got up almost to boiling. And I said, well, what in the world is going on here? But I think since we got it out anyway, well, let's go ahead and put a thermostat in it. And we did, and it heated right back up. So why was it that the thermostat passed the can test, but it didn't work in there? This is the long and the short of it. Most cases, unless you're trying to find an overheating problem, if you're trying to find out why it's running too cold, you're wasting your time heating the water up, seeing when it'll open. However, if you're trying to find an overheating problem, it's a good idea to put a thermostat in there and heat that water up and see when it opens up. If it doesn't open, that's more important than if it opens too soon, right? So that's when you're going to check it with the boiling water and the torch, when it's overheating, not when it's running too cold. If it's running too cold, how much does the thermostat cost in most cars? Like 20 bucks. No, about 8 $9 really? if you buy it from the parts house and you give it a gasket for 2 or 3 if you, Since you've got a thermostat in your hand anyway, why don't you just throw that one in the trash and put nothing in it? I will tell you this, though. I have, when I was working at Ford Place, I would put in like two or three thermostats before I got a good one. But one end still running too cold. Not as cold, but still too cold. And they'll throw a code, PO128 or PO125, if it's running too cold. Yeah, we come in there with a check engine light on or with a code. Huh? I got another one. Got another one. And if you're, if you're secure in your uh, position as somebody that knows what they're doing, you go back in there. See, when I went back in the parts room in there, and I don't want to toot my own horn, but I'd been there long enough to where I'd say, I need another thermostat. Well, let's give you one. I need another one. I don't care. That one ain't no good. And they would give it to me without question. Yeah. Now, if it's somebody that's just getting started, even if you know what you're talking about, they're going to question you and think you're a yo yo. You know what I mean? Because you know, parts people can be that way sometimes. You know, you ever notice that? Parts people are sort of skeptical and they think yeah. that you're a buffoon and this kind of thing. And yeah. you just got to prove them wrong enough times. And that yeah. way they wind up, you know. What was number four? Number four was the one that was between three and five. 
Okay, so that was that was C. Okay, technician A says a leaky heater core may show up as a drip on the carpet. Technician B says you can test a heater core for leaks during a pressure tester. How about that? Well, let's see. You can do that, Jim. Um, and the heater core, remember, hook a heater core uh, hoses up right so you don't make a heater core leak when there wasn't one. Technician A says a fan and clutch operation can be tested using a strobe light. Sure. Technician B says the fan and clutch should be locked up when the engine is cold. Who's right about that? A, a only. All right. Two technicians are discussing system flushing. Technician A says you should flush a system in the direction of normal coolant flow. Is he correct about that? Yes. No, he's wrong. Right. Technician B says the system should be flushed until clean water flows out of the system. He's correct. Now we use a machine out here. Now think about what we're doing. We're actually oh, yeah, taking. We, we do. We put it on the thermal, and we're pushing. Uh, our machine pushes coolant through the. It op pushes the thermostat open, and it pushes it backwards through the block, and it comes to the radiator the opposite direction. I didn't think about that. Yeah, and then it's basically. Done, now why do you do that? Because all of the rest of the scale and everything is pointing in the direction of coolant flow. And if you want to get them out of there, you're going to flow water the other day and break them off and blow them out there. See what I'm saying? That's the reason you do that. They're pretty smooth there. Uh, you have to just think logically about this stuff, you know. Uh, let me ask you this. If you put uh, big tires on your truck, will it cause the speedometer to be slower or faster? Slower. Huh? Why? I don't remember. I know, I know you told me it was you know how I do that? I actually extrapolate it farther in. I said, if my tires are an inch bigger, let's see, which way would I go? What if the tires were 20 feet in diameter? Wow, you'd be going really fast in this, but I'm going to be reading almost nothing, wouldn't you? <laughs> so that's how I figure that out. I, I, I take it to the extreme, and I say, that's how it would work that way. See, if, if it works in the extreme that way, it works a little bit in the minor stuff that way. Technician A says, if a core plug is leaking, that's what we call a freeze plug or expansion plug, and it's in a difficult location, an expandable rubber plug can be inserted into it. Technician B says rubber plug should always be installed dry. Uh, which technician is correct? C, both of them. Now, I have known a set of circumstances where people put the rubber plug in there and they didn't, the cooling system wasn't serviced right. A lot of miles later, the uh, place where the plug goes would rot away and you couldn't put anything in there that would stop it from leaking. All right, uh, two technicians are adjusting radiator removal. Technician A says you should use two wrenches as you loosen the cooler lines to the automatic transmission, if it's got that kind of fitting, right? Uh, technician B says cooler lines on modern vehicles might require special tools to disconnect quick, tech, quick connect type fittings, and that's basically number 10. Is Both of those are right, but if it's got a special tool, there's only one or the other. You're not going to have a special tool and two wrenches. Technician A says a major cause of engine overheating is a faulty thermostat that opens at too high temperature. Technician B says bleed notch or jiggle pin should be at the top when installing vertically mounted thermostats. That bleed notch is actually what lets the air out when you're filling the coolant system up. That little tiny air can go through that little bleed real good if it doesn't have one of those. But you know, you can, you can actually, uh, it seems to me like if you had a little tiny drill bit, you had one that didn't have that and it was mounted in a vertical position, you could drill it would be a hole in it. Now, if it's a horizontally mounted thermostat, it don't matter. Let me tell you this. This is just a brief little story so I can burn up some more time and make y'all late for lunch. This thing right here, uh, I had this Crown Victoria over here that I was doing a vehicle inspection on for the, you know, one of the state cars. And uh, I noticed that it was running too cold. Okay, so I had my, I plugged in my uh, wireless vehicle interface and I had it pulled up on the screen over there. And, it, and I let it run for a pretty good little while, and it got up to 160 degrees. Do I have to have another paper to take to her or just go see her? No, just go tell her that I said it was $5. How she, much? Five bucks. She'll believe you. Okay. All right. And, um, but anyway, the, um, the long and the short of it was uh, this thing I put up. I said, that thermostat is bad. I think I've got a thermostat over here that's brand new that I got on stock for one of these cars. So I shut the car off. I got my air ratchet, and I pulled the thermostat housing off. It's just right there on top. You didn't even lose any water. And I put that brand new thermostat in there, and I put it back on there, and I cranked it up, and within three minutes, it was up to 198. <laughs> I mean, it was instant difference that it made, instant difference. You know, I was thinking I didn't expect to see that kind of a change that fast, but it was already up to 160. didn't have far to go, see. But that was, uh, it was opening too early. All right, let's whip through the rest of these things. Uh, let me see. Number 11 was B. 
Technician A says uh, that after service is a good. You're thinking about that? Basically. All right. So let me see here. Um, we'll see. Number 22, number 23. Antifreeze concentration should be at least, but no more than. A. Hmm, that's a little tricky. And what about C? Um, 40, 67 percent. At least 40 percent, no more than 67. Um, and finally, when replacing a stretch top belt. No, excuse me. Which of these uh, two worn belts is a neoprene belt? Which of these belts is a, is a neoprene belt? Huh? Can you see the picture? Which of these two belts is neoprene? A is. What does neoprene mean? That's the stuff it's made out of. All right, that's A. And finally. When replacing a stretch type belt, that's what I was talking about a while ago, the old belt can be removed by cutting it off. That's true. You can. You can cut it off if it's a stretch type belt. You can cut it off if it ain't. If it's not a stretch type belt, you know, you're putting one on it, just get your knife and cut it. The reason that I don't do that is because I like to take the old belt and the new one and compare the length. And did you know a little devil, do you? A stretch type belt is one of those, like I was talking about, you got to put on a special tool. Got me. Um, but I mean, you can put a piece of canvas strap under it, roll it off there too, you know. Yeah. All right then.